Dr. William Schonberg is a professor in the Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering Department at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. Dr. Schonberg is a registered professional engineer in the states of Missouri and Alabama and has over 30 years of teaching and research experience in the areas of shock physics, spacecraft protection, hypervelocity impact, and penetration mechanics. He received his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the Princeton University in 1981 and his master's and doctorate degrees from Northwestern University in 1983 and 1986 respectively. The results of his research have been applied to a wide variety of engineering problems, including the development of orbital debris protection systems for spacecraft in low orbit Earth, low Earth orbit, in situ resource utilization for lunar habitats, kinetic energy weapons, the collapse of buildings under explosive loads, insensitive munitions, and aging aircrafts. Today, Dr. Schoenberg's talk is about space debris. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate everybody being here. And yes, we're gonna talk about stuff in space. I'm a simple kind of guy here. I uh, look at stuff sometimes maybe as either being useful or not useful. So when it comes to stuff in orbit, you know, we have useful stuff and we have, you know, not so useful stuff and useful stuff are satellites that still work and the not so useful is, uh, well, you know, that's, that's, that's the space junk. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about useful stuff to set the stage, and then we'll talk about the not useful stuff. But since uh, I'm a professor, and uh, I imagine my audience here is primarily students, you, you, you love pop quizzes when your faculty come into the classroom and they give you a pop quiz. So here we go, ready? What was the first Earth orbiting satellite? Tick, 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 tick. Okay, got your answers, right? In your head? Okay, who said the moon? If you said the moon, go to the top of the line. No, I'm just kidding. You get a thousand points for whatever good those are. But that was kind of a tricky question. I didn't say man-made satellite, human-made satellite. I just said satellite, of course. The first uh, human-made uh, satellite was Sputnik. If those of you who said Sputnik, yeah, 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 that's fine. No problem. Uh, put up by the uh, Russians. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the Americans put up the Explorer satellite. And after that, it's just been open season on launching satellites for various reasons. Um, from this chart, you can see that if you do your numbers right, you can probably see that about two thirds of the satellites that are up there um, have to do with function. Uh, what uh, have to do with communication as their main function. All right, that means military, uh, commercial, government, whatever. There's some science going on, there's some weather going on. There's some spying going on, but most of the satellites that are up there are basically what allow you to order pizza, okay? Or to, or to, or, or to text your friend. That's what the satellites are up there for. That's what most of them do. And this was fine, you know, until about 10 years ago, a bunch of countries launched, launched satellites and there were a few thousand satellites up there maybe, but about 10 years ago, along came new kids on the block and for those of you who are staring at this image and going, what is this? I understand you're not, you're not old. For those of you who, who know who this is, then yeah, you're old. But anyway, no, I mean, 10 years ago, saw the birth of satellite and a friend of mine said, don't call them mega constellations because they're not putting a million satellites up there, but large satellite constellations, many companies for various reasons, putting up thousands of satellites if you've been following SpaceX and Starlink, I think the latest statistic is spacing. So SpaceX uh, owns about a third uh, of the stuff that's up there. So that's that's pretty amazing when you think about it. And these these numbers, these plans, this is the original plans. You know, they, they, I, I, I think I need to hire someone just to update this slide for me every other day because these numbers are changing. But if you do the math real quick here, you'll see that various companies, and I think one of them already went bankrupt, so that's probably not going to happen, but I think they're being bought out now. Uh, we're talking 30, 40, 50,000 satellites in Earth orbit uh, in the next five to 10 years, which if you work in the satellite business, if you work in the space business, whether you're an astronomer or a space technology user, it's, it's, it's scary. Um, I understand large satellite constellations have their use and their purpose. It brings the internet to where none exists. Uh, it's good with better disaster management because different satellites have different kinds of uh, sensors, eyes as we call them, 
and they can hear different things, see different things. But you know, there is the serious consideration and concern that there is about a three to five percent failure rate on Starlink right now. And if you do the math and multiply the mass of each satellite and number of satellites that might fail, if the failure rate is three to five percent, you are putting a lot of useless junk in space. In addition to all the 95% stuff that works, there's three to 5% stuff that can't communicate, can't deorbit. It's just gonna sit up there for a little while. Um, and if you're an astronomer, you're gonna be really worried about the fact that these things are gonna come across your telescope, radio or visual uh, telescope and mess up your hours and months of, of preparation. So there is serious concern that the not so useful stuff, the orbital debris, is going to mess things up for a lot of people. Why do we have space debris? We have space debris because we've been living, working, playing in outer space for over 60 years now. We've launched about 9,000 um, satellites and about 3,000 of them roughly are still active. So where did these other 6,000 satellites go? They, some of them are still out there. Some of them have pieces from them still out there. Uh, some of them have been brought down to earth, but for the most part, they've hit things, they've corroded, they've exploded, uh, atomic oxygen erosion, uh, degradation, uh, uh, unspent fuel, collisions that instead of being gentle nudges become full-blown conflagration events. It, it, it's, it's, I guess, part of living and working in outer space. We leave a little trace of ourselves behind us no matter where we go or what we do. And so their space is, space is no different. Um, there is rocket boosters, there's breakup fragments, mission related debris, and there aren't any softballs up there, but I, I put this baseball up there and this marble on the image and this grain of sand on the image between the two fingers or this pebble so that you can see the relative scale that there are things up there that are uh, the size of sand grains but there are also things up there the size of school buses and everything in between. Uh, this is a chart that shows the growth of the debris population. Uh, LEO, of course, is uh, low Earth orbit is, is, is where the bulk of the uh, uh, debris is. And you, if you look at this, you will see distinct uh, jumps. That's when you've had either deliberate anti-satellite tests by countries that should have known better, or you have accidental collisions by uh, a, a defunct satellite with a live satellite. Uh, it, it's, it's, when, I, when I started the business in, in, in this business in the 1990s, uh, we were right around six to 8,000 and we thought, oh, well, you know, in the, in, the, in the mid 90s and early 2000s, it was kind of flat. It's probably not gonna go around above 8,000 and then bad things happen. So here we are, we're, we're upwards of 14, 15, 16,000 pieces of uh, objects in Earth orbit. And that's a lot of stuff. What can happen if uh, something from Earth orbit hits you? Well, if it's small, it could ruin your telescope or it could put a hole in your spacesuit and kill you, or it could maybe do nothing if you're in a big module. If you get hit by something the size of a softball or a baseball, no matter who you are or where you are or what you're doing, it's a bad day. So a lot of what happens to you depends on what hits you. Um, yeah, so if you're up there doing a spacewalk, an EVA, yeah, something the size of a sand of grain, uh, something the size of a, a, of a, a grain of sand can penetrate, can puncture your spacesuit, which would also be a really bad day. Uh, what do we do to protect our spacecraft? Well, it depends on what's, what's in there. If it's a satellite, in uh, geosync, then there's not that much debris up there. And so we're probably not gonna put a lot of protection on it. If it's uh, the International Space Station where there's, you know, our friends, colleagues, relatives, parents, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews are up there, then we're gonna want to protect that as much as we possibly can. How do we protect that? Well, there's three different basic schools of thought, philosophies of protection. Uh, active protection, uh, the phrase, the, <laughs> the name Buck Rogers comes to mind. You, uh, you blast the heck out of it if you, as you see it, right? Um, if you've been paying attention to uh, the problems of space debris and how space debris happens, uh, you could probably figure out what is the problem with blasting something out of your way. So for the most part, uh, 
we've done what are called uh, spacecraft avoidance maneuvers. Uh, this chart illustrates, for example, how often um, the space station has had to make uh, avoidance maneuvers. And the orange uh, is, a, is a year by year uh, histogram of those maneuvers. And they range from anywhere from five in one year in 2014, yeah, 2005, six, seven, they didn't have to do any, but in 2010 to 2015, they, they did about 10 uh, avoidance uh, maneuvers. So they were warned. There's a, they, they, they travel with a shoebox around themselves, so to speak. And if there's a debris whose path is gonna cross within that shoebox, then they have to make uh, a, uh, an, an avoidance maneuver. Uh, operational procedure is uh, sort of the middle ground. You can get out of the way of something if you can see it. You can protect yourself against it if you can't. But if there's, there's stuff in there in between that you can't really see, but it's big enough that if it hits you, it can cause really big damage. And if it's too big to protect against, because then you'll never launch. Uh, operational protection means flying with the engines of the what used to be the space shuttle uh, forward in the RAM direction, protect the variable cargo, expose the heat shield if, you know, to outer space un unless needed. Um, and so it's basically working smart, living smart in outer space. Passive protection is kind of like the bumper on your car. It's kind of like insurance. You don't need a bumper until you need a bumper. You don't need your insurance until you need your insurance, but you carry it around with you every single day just in case you might need it. So a bumper is basically a piece of material, a wall that's in, put in front of the spacecraft to protect it, to make sure that if something hits it, it will disintegrate it and what eventually travels in towards the spacecraft is diffuse enough so that it's not gonna do a lot of damage. Uh, how do we protect the space station? Here are all the hot spots on the space station. And these are all the spots, parts of the space station that have the most shielding because it's they're the ones that are facing the ram direction as the space station travels. So these are the really shielded elements. Does the space station get hit? all the time. Uh, does, is there damage? Everywhere. Yeah, okay, everywhere. Is the damage severe? Thankfully, not yet, okay? But there are little holes, there are pings, there are dings, there, are, there, there is damage uh, to the stuff that's on the space station. Uh, sometimes we identify parts of the space station that are weak in terms of protection. They give rise to a large probability of possible damage. So we enhance those shields and those gray squares that you see there are shield enhancements that were put on uh, a, a Russian module to increase the protection of that particularly sensitive area. And so that kind of gives you an introduction into what space debris is all about. Some recent studies that I've been involved in, I just thought I'd touch on a couple of uh, things here that we that we worked on to give you a sort of a sense of what's, uh, what's uh, cooking uh, in, the, in the space debris world. Uh, one of the studies looked at whether or not a composite overwrap pressure vessel will just have a hole in it after rupture, or could it possibly explode? You know, conventional wisdom says, oh, once you get a hole in it, it's going to explode. That was the wisdom that was currently used in the design process, and we found that that is not the case. Uh, the work was funded by NASA, uh, lots of different folks, lots of different agencies being involved. The idea was that you have in every spacecraft whether it's robotic or human, pressurized vessels, whether there are fuel tanks, whether there are living quarters, uh, either way you have to protect your spacecraft against possible damage due to space debris. And we looked, we've been looking in thousands and thousands of test shots against flat unpressurized plates, but very few, because it is scary, very few tests against highly pressurized uh, metallic or composite overwrap pressure vessels. Okay, the, and so we decided to work to see if we could rectify that problem. Here is an example of an early drawing, an early sketch of a JPSS satellite where that black um, dome in the middle, that, is, uh, that was a composite overwrap pressure vessel fuel tank exposed to outer space. So it was right out there, ready to get hit. Now they buried it and covered it and wrapped it ever since the design continued, but until you think about it, you don't know that this is a possibility. And so to understand what we mean by rupture as opposed to a small hole or crack, here's a tank. And I've kind of uh, you know put a little gray dot in where the hole is. You can see it on the 
on the left, if you look real close, if you need to, you know, it's, it's basically a hole. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a small hole. This is a rupture. Under the right impact conditions, uh, this thing will explode into many pieces. And so this is what we wanted to be able to predict when it would happen. So we developed an equation that would be able to kind of like thread in between without being too convoluted, thread in between regions of rupture and regions of non-rupture, depending on the operating conditions and the impact conditions, okay? And so this is what we got, which, you know, you kind of need a magnifying glass to see what's going on in there. But basically in the close-up, all the orange are ruptures, all the greens and blues are non-ruptures. And this is what we wanted. We wanted to come up with a line, the black line, the dashed lines are the plus minus one, plus minus two uh, sigma lines, but we wanted a, a line that would go right in between all the rupture and non-rupture points. And we were able to manipulate the data, be clever about how we non-dimensionalize things and come up with an equation. The data kind of floated for a while, but eventually then you know, kind of separated out and we were able to draw a line right in between the data. Uh, the next topic that's kind of a hot topic right now is passivation of spacecraft and especially spacecraft pressure vessels. Again, thanks to the uh, NASA Safety Center for uh, providing the support. Uh, basically, all spacefaring nations agencies have requirements that to, 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 to make sure that your spacecraft, if you're gonna build a spacecraft and launch a spacecraft, you have to prove, certify, confirm that your spacecraft will not cause, will not create more debris, okay? And what that means is, the phrase is stored energy devices. It doesn't just have to be batteries. It doesn't have to be fuel tanks, but all stored energy devices have to be passivated at the end of the spacecraft's mission or useful life or whatever. Um, not everybody can do that. It costs money, <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay, and, and, and that's, that's the reality. Uh, they're, they're, the engineering is there, the physics is there, we know how to do this, but to actually do it uh, is, a bit of a, is a bit of an effort. So what spacecraft designers do is they file for NASA, they file for waivers with NASA, they, uh, they, they, they say, yeah, we're not gonna be able to do what's called a full passivation or a hard passivation, but, but we're pretty sure that we can, that, that the odds of bad things happening are really, really small. And so NASA ends up uh, either asking them to go re revisit their calculations, fix their calculations, or grant a waiver. Um, this, is, this is the NASA standard that addresses passivation, uh, which basically consists of two parts. These are the rules. You have to make sure that all sources are depleted, all energy sources disconnected when they're no longer uh, required, which is pretty harsh. Because if those of you who are involved, involved in spacecraft design probably are thinking to yourselves, well, well now, wait a minute, you know, most spacecraft design is, uh, is written to the effect that, you know, have to show that there's a 99.95% probability of things not happening. That language is not here. The language here is all, all, everything has to be passivated, which is a very odd requirement. Um, and then if you can't do that, then you have to show this is a possibility that's true, that whatever is left cannot cause an explosion large enough to release the breed. Not won't cause to a certainty of 99%, but cannot cause. This is an absolute requirement. If you cannot meet either part one or part two, strictly speaking, you shouldn't launch. But waivers are given, launches take place based on experience, based on analysis. And we decided then to come up with a process that would help with that analysis process. What if you were able to calculate how many rupture causing projectiles you might encounter at the end of your lifetime? And then you can say, well, that number is big, that number is small, the smaller that number is, the more sure you are that your spacecraft won't result in a problem. Okay, and the process is actually pretty straightforward, but it was fun to work on this and get it all together. Um, you know, given 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 where your spacecraft is, what's the most what's the what's the angle of of impact that you're most likely to see? Okay, that's step number one. Step num number two is okay. 
at that angle and velocity, what's the diameter of the particle that's going to cause your tank to rupture? Okay. Next question, step three. How many of those pen rupturing particles are you going to expect to see in the remaining 25 years of your passivated lifespan? Okay. Well, first you calculate flux per meter squared per year, and then you calculate the total number. And then bottom line, you look at the total number. Is it a big number? Is it a small number? We looked at two satellites, two different pressure tanks. Um, for these, both of these satellites, uh, the, 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 the orbital debris environment predicted about 15 kilometer second, kilometer per second impact straight on. Uh, so given these tanks and their configurations, what sizes of projectiles will cause rupture? So this is another rupture limit equation that I developed uh, for metallic tanks in these, in these particular cases. So you can use this equation to calculate the size of the particle that will cause a rupture. Hmm. Next question. How many of these particles are going to be out there? Should we be worried about that? In those orbits, how many of these particles are going to be out there? And so for these two satellites, you find out that the flux is really, really small per meter squared of exposed surface area per year. And when you roughly guesstimate the meter squared and multiply by 25 years, you find that the number of particles over 25 years that's going to hit the tank that's going to cause it to rupture is really, 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 really small. So this, this kind of calculation is meant to increase confidence in your uh, ability, in your statement, in your claim that even though you may not be able to fully passivate and totally satisfy the requirement, then however, that your calculations show that, look, even if we get hit by something that's going to rupture this, look at the odds of that ever happening. How many particles? I mean, over 25 years, I'm going to, I, I, I would need to be out there 20, one, two, three, 25,000 years before I would see three particles. So I would see my first particle in 8,000 years, probabilistically speaking, statistically speaking. So there is a very slim chance that I will rupture and cause more debris. So that is your brief introduction to the wherefores and the whys of orbital debris and a brief introduction to a couple of recent uh, projects, recent problems that uh, have been worked on uh, that I was able to work on with NASA uh, to use this information and to hopefully make space travel safer and to uh, protect uh, those who we send up there uh, into space in, in, in our spacecraft now and in the future. So that concludes my presentation. And if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Schomburg. If anyone has questions, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Dr. Schomburg, this is Josh Rovi, University mm -hmm. of Illinois. You talked about constellations you know, at the very beginning of your, your, your talk here, mentioned constellations where we're talking about maybe thousand or thousands of spacecraft. How does that affect then the probability of a collision when you talk about you know, you know, your number of particles here, right, is 0 0.003, but if I have a thousand spacecraft in my constellation, isn't there now a, a strong probability that one of them will encounter a particle and you know, catastrophically fail? Right now, the calculations that these companies have been doing, and they're all very reassuring calculations, uh, indicate that they have sufficient knowledge and sufficient engineering design to avoid hitting each other, to avoid failing, and to avoid causing more debris on their own. Now, um, so in a sense, they are, they, they are working that end of the problem. This end of the problem about, about the passivation, I don't think has been looked at yet, uh, but the gut instinct that perhaps you you share is that this is uh, this is something that needs to get looked at because this is one satellite in one orbit. It's 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 maybe a, a, a highly conservative number, uh, but if you can, but if you multiply it by a thousand, then all of a sudden you're within the range of eh, it can happen. So yeah, this is something that needs to be revisited for the constellations. I think yeah. Uh, Dr. Schomburg, um, my name is Matthew Wallace. I'm a sophomore at Parkland College right now. 
actually I've been working in the automotive industry as a passive engineer, a safety engineer for hmm. uh, Volvo Group. Um, I, I just want to go back to, is there a point where there's going to be so much debris in space that we're, no, we're no, no longer going to be able to operate in space or even launch missions to Mars and beyond? If I could, if, if I could answer that question with the 995 certainty, then, you know, I would, I would indeed be a very clever man. However, um, I, let, me, let me just put the let me just put it this way. I guess the answer is yes, there is that possibility. However, uh, there are a lot of really smart people in a lot of different countries working to keep that from happening. Um, you've perhaps and, and, and those of you who've, who, who've heard this uh, or, or read about this uh, phenomenon called the Kessler syndrome. That uh, was proposed by uh, Don Kessler uh, several decades ago about that very possibility that yes, if we are not careful, we will put so much debris up there that basically it will have the same effect as uh, nuclear fission, where it's a chain reaction. And instead of just, I mean, I, 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 I mean you've seen the cartoons about nuclear fission, you know, one particle hits, two particles created, and then, then, you know, they told two friends and they told two friends and pretty soon, boom, you know, you have a nuclear you know, reaction going on. Uh, it's, it is a possibility that you have enough debris that it doesn't have a, have a chance to clear itself. And there's so much stuff out there that it's basically setting up a chain reaction and you could have that. But there are a lot of people working really hard to keep that from happening. I'll go again if that's, if that's all right. This is go Josh Rovey, University of Illinois. Uh, Dr. Schomer, could you say a little bit about the materials that are used uh, to protect spacecraft? Uh, so one of your slides, I think you you called out aluminum, maybe corrugated mm -hmm. aluminum, Kevlar. Are these kind of typical materials that are used for protection? It's the the response of materials to to incredibly high speed impact is way different than anything we have in our experience database uh, you know whether 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 we hit something with our head or our fist or or, or or baseball or 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 a rifle or whatever i mean these are all relatively low velocity events when you when you get into incredibly high velocity events like being hit by orbital debris which can be which can go as fast as 15 kilometers a second in uh in 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 earth orbit that's closing velocity uh typically you have to balance um density and and well and weight but the idea is that you have to have it's 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 no longer putting up the strongest material the material with the highest strength uh the, these these events are basically hydrodynamic at those velocities at those really high velocities and and strength is really a secondary uh feature that that comes into play only in the uh, cooling down stage of the of the of the uh, impact event so um, the aluminum, there was, a, there was an optimization study done by NASA uh, about 30 years ago where aluminum had, was, was right on target in terms of density, uh, strength, uh, corrosiveness, it, it, all that. And so aluminum is a really good uh, bumper, if you will, uh, to protect your spacecraft against uh, debris impact. Great, thank you. Thank you very much.